Well, I encourage you to grab your Bibles and open them to 1 John chapter 5. This morning, we are wrapping up our study in the book of 1 John. Uh, We'll be looking at verses 16 through 21. Now, last week, I know many of you were not able to be here, but we studied verses 13 through 15 as we further looked at the subjects of assurance and prayer, that we may know we have eternal life in the Son, and that we also have access to God the Father in prayer. And also, we were called by the Apostle to trust and to delight in God through prayer. Because as we noted, God delights in hearing and answering the prayers of his children. And so we are to pray by faith, with patience, and in obedience and submission for God's greater wisdom and will to be done. In fact, this is why we ought to draw near in prayer through Christ, asking God the Father to make us more like his Son, Jesus Christ, and do in us what pleases him most. So we should pray as Jesus prayed in the garden, not my will, but your will be done. Now, this is what the confident believer does, who has believed in the name of the Son of God and knows that they have eternal life. In fact, this is the assurance John spoke of back in verse 13. And now as we come to our final exposition here in chapter 5, John is going to move from general prayer in the Christian life to prayer of what we would call the prayer of intercession for other Christians' lives. Really here the apostle will address our care and God's care towards the wandering brother and even the carelessness of hardened hearts and apathetic apostates who are indifferent to the gospel. And see, John will show us when it is necessary and when it is good to pray for our brothers and sisters who are wrestling and battling sin. And he'll also show us when it is not necessary to pray for those who are indifferent and hardened towards the message of the gospel. And so this is what we're going to find in our outline as we read verses 16 through 21. And so hear the word of the Lord. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin, not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. Forgive me. Back in verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have toward him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the requests that we have asked of him. If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life to those who commit sins that do not lead to death. There is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. All wrongdoing is sin, but there is sin that does not lead to death. We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, But he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. We know that we are from God, and the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true, and we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. He is the true God and eternal life. Little children, keep yourselves from idols. And praise be to God for his word. Now, it was not my intention to read a few extra verses and forgive my uh, forgetfulness there, but I think it's still helpful as we look at this subject of prayer at the beginning of our exposition. Uh, Throughout our study in 1 John, the apostle has focused now on some key subjects. And this is not the entirety of what he is focused on, 
But we find first that something that has been dominant in his letter is our belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, Jesus' incarnation, that God took on flesh, that he was truly, Jesus was truly baptized in water and he died physically on that cross where his blood was poured out for sinners like us. And the apostle had also focused on our obedience to God's commandments, saying that if we abide, if we love, and if we know God, then that will show in our moral character and obedience. In fact, in chapter 3, verse 23, John said, and this is God's commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he has commanded us. In there we find the simple summary, love God and love one another. And so we're first to love God with all our heart and mind and strength and soul. This is the outcome of believing in the name of his son, Jesus Christ. And secondly, we're also to love Christians. We're to love one another. We're to love the brethren, the believers here in this place, and also the entire body of Christ, just as he has commanded. And even one of the ways we love one another is through our prayers for one another. And so as we come to these verses in our outline, John is giving us instructions for how we are to pray for a believer that is wrestling with sin And that is caught in sin. In verse 16 that we read, John says, If anyone sees his brother committing a sin not leading to death, he shall ask and God will give him life. And one of the realities to the Christian life is that every single one of us still wrestles with sin. And no matter who you are or how far you've matured in the Christian faith, While you are here on earth, you are going to be affected by sin. You're going to struggle with it. You will battle and struggle with sin. And sadly, some are even going to, at times, backslide into sin. This is why we acknowledge when we sing that great hymn, Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart. Oh, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. All of us are vulnerable and susceptible to sin. Because it's not an issue outside of us. No, sin is a deep-rooted problem within us. And no matter how much we think our sin only affects us, our, our week, our, our moments, our, ours, ourselves individually, really sin affects the whole church. In fact, this is why in Galatians chapter 6, Paul begins by telling the whole church, brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. And so that means the sin in my life and the sin in your life not only affects your relationship with God, but it also affects your relationship with one another. Because again, sin affects the whole church. This is why John is telling us what to do regarding a brother or sister who is committing a sin not leading to death. The apostle is calling for prayers of intercession, which here means praying for our fellow believers when they are losing the battle of temptation and sin. And so this is one of the ways... We're to deal with sin in the congregation. We're to pray. We're not to turn a blind eye to when we see others struggling or or failing to walk in the way of the Lord. No, we're to pray. How often do you pray for the church? For the believers here? How often are the brothers and sisters names in your mouth and in your prayers? Again, remember, do not forget, as we learned last week, God delights in hearing and answering the prayers of his children. So John is telling us, if a brother or sister in Christ 
is committing a sin not leading to death. We're to pray earnestly to the Lord. Asking him to restore the believer. Now here John speak, speaks of a sin that does not lead to death. And it's not specifically clear what sin does or does not lead to death. Many have uh, thought on certain things and said it's this or it's this. And so even as we walk through the exposition, there may be parts where you disagree with the application. But here, what I believe the Apostle Paul or Apostle John is speaking of is sin that may be forgiven. John had told us about the seriousness of sin and the outcome of one who claims to not have it, the one who does not have it or who falls into it. In 1 John chapter 1, back in verse 8 through 10, in chapter 1, John had begun in the first chapter by saying, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In verse 10, if we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. And so we ought to pray for our brothers in Christ that they would confess their sin and go to the one who cleanses us from all unrighteousness because church we need to remember we need to remember the words of John back in chapter 2 verse 1 when he tells us my little children I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin but if anyone does sin we have an advocate with the father Jesus Christ the righteous now see John expects that sin is going to be a struggle It's going to be a reality among the people of God. But he also expects that we are going to fight it. That we're going to return to our advocate when we stumble in it. But still understand there are times, whether out of blindness or immaturity or stubbornness of our flesh, there are times we commit sins not leading to death and we sadly remain in that state of sin. And so the apostle tells us that we need to pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. John also tells us in verse 16, he shall ask and God will give him life. Have you ever noticed that when you commit sins and you've lost to a particular struggle, it's like the life has almost been sucked out of you, consumes your mind. It affects your body. This is one of the things that happens to believers. Sin so affects us that we feel the weight and the consequences of unrepentant sin. We feel the shame of it. David expresses this in Psalm 32. In verse 3 and 4, he says, For when I kept silent, my bones wasted away through my groaning all day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My strength was dried up as by the heat of summer. Many believers who have committed sin, not leading to death, have felt that depleting outcome. And certainly, as the psalmist mentions, our physical bodies feel the effect. Our mind is in a sense of torment when we are walking in unrepentant sin. So the seriousness of the life that John is speaking of is eternal life. And so we need to remember and we need to realize that our practices and our behaviors are an indicator of the health of our life. Remember, our life is not our own. Paul tells us in Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself For me, our lives are to be marked by life in Christ. But when we commit sin, we're taking our eyes off the life-giving source, which is Jesus Christ. 
And so John tells us when we pray for these brothers and sisters and ask God in his kindness and mercy to lead them to repentance, he will answer. And he will give them life. Now remember, at the same time, there are some who have the appearance of Christianity, but no life. They do not have saving grace in their heart. And in light of this issue, John tells us again at the end of verse 16, there is sin that leads to death. I do not say that one should pray for that. Now here, the apostle doesn't seem to prohibit praying for this. But it does seem that this serious sin is past that point. That John is saying it is led to death. James chapter 5 verse 19 and 20 almost seems like a precursor to this. When James says, my brothers, if anyone among you wanders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. Now when John speaks of the sin that leads to death, what is this sin? Well, again, some believe this refers to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, as Jesus speaks of in Matthew 12 and Mark chapter 3. And others have said that this is a reference to a hardened refusal toward the message of the gospel, the truth of the gospel. And I think in looking closely at the letter of 1 John, I don't know that I would say it's either this or it's that. I actually think both are quite clearly in view. Again, in the immediate context of John's letter, it seems consistent that this sin that leads to death is in regards to a hardened opposition in heart and in mind. And so sin that leads to death is seen in corrupt belief. The person absolutely rejects that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. Uh, understand, John had said back in verse 10, that whoever does not believe God has made him a liar because he has not believed in the testimony that God is born concerning his son. And even back in chapter 2, in verse 22 and 23, the apostle states explicitly by asking, Who is the liar but he who denies that Jesus is the Christ? This is the Antichrist, he who denies the Father and the Son. No one who denies the Son has the Father. Whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. And so, of course, in this, in a sense, this absolutely relates to the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Because when the person is consciously hardened in opposition towards the truth of the gospel, the person is rejecting truth. And what did John just tell us back in verse 6? The Holy Spirit is truth. And so it becomes clear that this person has corrupt belief. And even they have corrupt behavior. They do not love God, and nor do they love the brethren. As John told us back in chapter 2, verse 4, Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And again, down in verse 11 of chapter 2, John says, Whoever hates his brother is in the darkness and walks in the darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And so this is the sin that leads to death. And John wants us to know the seriousness of sin. It is seen in corrupt belief and corrupt behavior that leads absolutely away. From the Lord. And he says here in verse 17, all wrongdoing is sin. It's as if John wants us to understand he has not just now dealt with the worst scenario possible. So saying we can all sit back and go, Phew, at least I didn't commit the sin leading to death. No, John wants us to know all wrongdoing is sin. There's no scapegoat in that. But he says there is sin that does not lead to death. Again, the apostle has not wanted us to make light of sin. That we would go off into lawlessness or worldliness. 
But he does want us to know that our freedom is in Christ. That we have an advocate with the Father. And that by grace through faith, we may come to him, repenting of our sin that does not lead to death. Because God is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so in this, brothers and sisters, we should be continually in prayer for our fellow believers who have gone off into sin that does not lead to death. And we should pray that they might cling to Christ. And as we pray, we should also do so for ourselves. We should remember that when we feel the weight and the shame of our sin, that we must also remember, we must know, as John would tell us, that we have a Savior who is the propitiation for our sin. He is our advocate with the Father. John tells us in the first part of verse 18, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, but he, that is Jesus Christ, who has been born of God, protects him. Now, here, we need to understand and remember the distinctiveness of the incarnate Christ. Jesus is not a created being by God. He is the only begotten Son of God. John tells us he protects us. He keeps and preserves his sheep. Church, I pray that you would come to know that there is safety in the Lord Jesus Christ. As Fanny Crosby writes in one of her great hymns, Jesus, my heart's dear refuge, Jesus has died for me. Firm on the rock of ages, ever my trust shall be. Safe in the arms of Jesus, safe On his gentle breast, there by his love overshaded, sweetly my soul shall rest. Understand, safety in our Savior is not the removal of difficulty. It is the certainty of Christ with us, Christ in us, and Christ always before us. See, genuine believers will still be tempted They will still be enticed by sin, but they will not keep on sinning. It will not become their life. This is because habitual, constant sinning is not the mark of a Christian. It's actually the mark of someone who is not a Christian. Rather, what John has told us is that they belong to the devil. In fact, John had said back in chapter 3, verse 8, whoever makes a practice of sinning, is of the devil. For the devil has been sinning from the beginning. And so here we come again to the comparisons John often brings up. We have the children of the devil, which are those who are of the world. They are corrupt in morals and depraved in heart and mind. But that is not so with the believer. They've been born of God, John says. They're transformed in morals, and they are made new in heart and mind. And so what that means is that sin no longer rules in their lives. This is why John has said here, everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning. Are we going to wrestle with sin? Yes. But we have a Savior who is greater than our sin. And so it does not rule in our lives. Paul helpfully outlines this in Romans 6 when he says in verses 11 through 13, you must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body to make you obey its passions. Do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life. This is how we ought to consider ourselves. As those who have been born of God, we are now dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. 
This is how we may fight and abstain from sin. We cling to the Savior and Lord Jesus for help. Because there is safety in Him. There is safety in our Savior and He protects us from destruction and our enemy. Again, as John writes here in verse 18, in light of Jesus' protection of God's children, <clears throat> he says the evil one does not touch him. Now again, back in <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 8, John told us a comforting truth about Christ who protects us. He said the reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. And so by the work of our Savior Jesus Christ, we are no longer in bondage to sin or slavery to sin. Satan has lost the power of his works because the Son of God appeared to destroy them. See, church, since Jesus has destroyed Satan's works and set us free to live a life of obedience in him, we're delivered that we may delight. Now, there are often times where, even among Christian communities, what we find is there is either too high a view of our enemy or too low a view of our enemy. Uh, oftentimes, there are environments where we have a high view. We think that as God is all powerful, Satan is all powerful, that our enemy is equal to our Lord, and that is not the case. Satan is a created being, and so we must remember he is not all-powerful. Yes, we find in the book of Job that there are permissions he has given from our sovereign God to bring certain harms, but John is reminding us Satan may not lead us to destruction. The evil one does not touch him. And so the enemy cannot touch us or remove us from our Savior. Jesus said of his sheep in John 10, verse 28, I give them eternal life and they will never perish. And no one will snatch them out of my hand. What a great hope and security and safety we have in Jesus Christ. That in light of all that he has done and all that he continues to do, the evil one, does not touch those born of God. Now again, do you remember what John had told the believers back in chapter 2? When he gave a short list of reasons he was writing, he had said to the young believers, those who were more likely immature, he said in verse 14, I write to you, young men, because you are strong. And the word of God abides in you. And you have overcome the evil one. You are strong in the Lord. God's word abides in you and you have overcome the enemy. All of this is what we have by faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. He protects us and therefore we have overcome both the world and our enemy. Remember just a few weeks ago, we studied in verse 4 of chapter 5 here, where John said, Everyone who has been born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. Church, we have a very real enemy. And he doesn't need you to follow him or worship him. That's not his goal. He just doesn't want you to worship or obey God. In fact, Jesus said of our enemy in John 10, that the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. And so if we want to fight sin and stand against the schemes of our great and terrible enemy, we must look upon our Savior. We must believe in and trust our Savior, remembering the victory that has been won in Him. But we often Sing that old hymn that gives us a profound application in spiritual warfare. But when Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there who made an end to all my sin. Because the sinless Savior died, my sinful soul is counted free. 
For God the just is satisfied to look on him and pardon me. This is part of our great assurance and confidence in the Christian life. That in Christ, we have spiritual life and we are protected. And so even in the following verse here, John returns to his focus on Christian assurance. He wants us to know, he says in verse 19, that we are from God. Now how do we know? How can we know? Well, we know because only those who have Christ have this protection and care. Again, in John chapter 10, in John's gospel, at the end of verse 10, right after Jesus spoke of the destructive nature and work of the devil, he also said of himself as the great shepherd that he came that his sheep may have life and have it Abundantly. Friends, an abundant life is a life that is lived dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. But a life that is lived in the clutches of the evil one is a life that is filled with theft and death and destruction. And so here again, we're reminded of this comparison that John keeps coming back to. Here's the picture of the children of God, and here is the picture of the children of Satan. And in that, we're reminded there is no middle ground. There's no neutrality. There's no alternative opinion. Everyone is either of God's kingdom or Satan's. Paul reminded us in Colossians 1.13 that the Father has delivered us from the domain of darkness, from that kingdom, and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved son. And so this is why John shows us this important comparison between those who are of God and those who are of the devil. In fact, in the end of verse 19, John shows the reality of Satan's kingdom. He says the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Now, not to over do the point, but when John says the whole world lies on the power of the evil one, it doesn't mean simply that he just has it and he's gripping onto it. Satan's grip is tight. He's fighting for the battle, but he's won the, or lost the war. And yet the word John uses here, that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one, is a word the scriptures often use when speaking of, of a babe with its mother. It's nestled there. It's where it finds safety and comfort. And so what John is saying is it's not just that Satan is holding on tightly and gripping them. It's where they long to lie. It's where non-believers are comforted in. In the power of the evil one. Again, this is a very stark contrast to those who are of God. And so since the corrupt world is under the rule of the devil, we must avoid the corruption of the world. Back in chapter 2, John had warned us about the lures and the sinful practices of this world. I turn back to chapter 2 and We'll look at verses 15 through 17 together. In chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, John told us, Do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and pride of life, is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. John does not want us to be enticed by or even affectionate towards this corrupt world. Because again, as he tells us now in verse 19, the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. But you are of God. 
This is what John wants us to resolve on. Remember this comparison. You are not of the world, but through the Lord Jesus Christ, you are of God. And we know this, that even when we are faced with temptations and trials of this world, what we long for is Christ and his protection. And really, this is why we need to pray, because the lures of sin take our eyes off of Christ. And when our brothers and sisters are not longing for Christ, we should pray, Lord, take their eyes off the futile things of this world and put them upon Christ. This is where the believer can say, take the world, but give me Jesus. Sweetest comfort of my soul, with the Savior watching over me, I can sing, though thunders roll. Friends, are you of God or of the world? See, the believer is protected in Christ. But the non-believer is in the power of the evil one. As see, as John is coming to a close in his letter... He is wanting the believers to know these difficult but important things while also having great confidence and assurance in the truth. This is my kind of letter, honestly. Uh, I often get told, even if I have a smile on my face, I just look cranky and angry. I'm just a grumpy old man in a young man's body. I just haven't caught up to my grumpiness. And so I'll often want to say great and encouraging truths, but I sometimes say them with a tone of difficulty. And there's a sense in which I think we can read these things from John. But to be careful not to impose that upon the text, we should remember that John has both had a concern and a great care for the people. He's not wanting them to walk away from difficult truths, saying, well, it's hopeless. We'll just walk off and do whatever. No, he's wanting to warn them and assure them. But this is why he turns now in verse 20 to say, And we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding, so that we may know him who is true. And we are in him who is true, in his Son, Jesus Christ. See, not only has Christ come in the flesh at his first advent, but in his coming, John says he has given us understanding. It's not simply that someone told us, here, take the Bible, figure it out. No, God has given them understanding and has given us understanding through faith and repentance in Christ. And so John says he has given us understanding. This is who reveals to us the truth of God's word. In fact, we find an example of this in Luke 24, verse 45. Luke tells us after the resurrection of Jesus, two disciples were walking down the road. And verse 45 of Luke 24 says, Jesus opened their minds to understand the scriptures. And many read the scriptures. Atheists memorize scripture for certain debates. They don't understand the scriptures. Only the child of God in the Lord Jesus Christ understands the scriptures. And so John wants us to know that Jesus has come in his incarnation, in his full humanity, and he has given us understanding so that we may truly know him. John says of the believers in the church, we know him and we are in him who is true. Isn't it profound that what John is telling us is our confidence is exactly what Jesus prayed for in his high priestly prayer. That in verse 3 of John 17, Jesus prayed, this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. And now John is telling us he was sent. He has come. He is fully God, fully man. And he has given us understanding. That by God's grace and the work of His Spirit, we know the truth that saves. We know the one who saves. We know Him and we are in Him who is true. And John also tells us at the end of verse 20, 
He is the true God and eternal life. And so John begins to end here by defending the full divinity and humanity of Jesus. He is declaring the Son's intimate relationship with the Father. Now see, remember, where John ends is often similar to where he begins. We find that in his gospel letter, and I believe we find that here in his pastoral letter. Because in the beginning of his letter here, the apostle began with the coming of the word of life. If you turn back to chapter 1, in verse 1 and 2, John began by telling us this. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we looked upon and have touched with our hands concerning the word of life, the life was made manifest. It was put on display, John is saying, and we have seen it and testified to it and proclaimed to you the eternal life which was with the Father and was made manifest to us. This is the way John had first described Jesus' coming in the flesh. Now, in his gospel letter, John says, in John chapter 1, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of of grace and truth. And now he closes in his letter of 1 John with the certainty that the Son of God has come and also that we may know Him who is true. We are in Him who is true, in His Son, Jesus Christ. See, what I want you to understand is that this is not a theory or an abstract idea. No, the Christian faith is rooted in the practical truth that God became man in the person of Jesus Christ. But friends, do you believe that truth? Do you know Him? And are you in Him? See, the apostle here is encouraging genuine believers that Jesus is God, the second person of the Trinity. He is the true God and eternal life. And so while it may sound overdramatic to some, this is really a matter of life and death. Do you believe that truth? John is saying this is how you know that you are of God, that you are born of God. You know him who is true and you are in him who is true. See, friends, there are many who believe in a Jesus with a lowercase j. He neither saves, nor does he come in any advent, and he neither protects, nor does he have any power to overcome. They believe in a Jesus of their own making. And this, I believe, is the reason why the apostle concludes in verse 21 by saying, Little children, keep yourselves from idols. Now, idolatry is not a very popular conversation. You don't often hear people talk about it. In fact, our world makes light of it. One of the most popular singing and music shows is American Idol. People tune in and find who can we particularly idolize the most. And so our world is filled with idolatry. And it's not often understood in the church. And you don't often hear people say to one another, listen, I've realized I've let certain things, I've let certain people take the place of God in my life and I'm wrongfully worshiping that. Think about it. One of the things we never want to talk about is how much we idolize our own sleep and our rest and our leisure. If you don't think that's true, just watch of what people do in replacement of the Lord's Day. You often don't hear, I've been studying and growing in my knowledge of Christ in God's Word, and there are things that I thought about Jesus that just aren't true. So Lord, forgive me and keep me from idols. You don't hear those things very often. It doesn't mean we don't hear them at all. But those are absolutely things we need to say, we need to think on, and things we need to pray as followers of Christ. 
See, church, I think that John has added this little exhortation at the end of his letter because it is easy for us to create things and even be deceived by things that can lead us away from the truth of who God is in the person and work of Jesus Christ. Think of how often people's minds are even brought to images of Jesus and film depictions of Jesus. And yet, most of what is formed and presented in Christian media doesn't reflect the Christ of Scripture. In fact, it fascinates me that two of the most popular films about Jesus in our culture are depicted by a Catholic and a Mormon, neither of which understands the truth of who Jesus is. And so John gives us an exhortation, little children, keep yourselves from idols. See, brothers and sisters, if we are not listening to the word of God, looking to the word of God, and seeking to learn and grow in who the true son of God is, we are likely in danger of following a God that is not the God of the Bible. We will be deceived and we will build up for ourselves a Jesus with a lowercase j. The psalmist warns of idolatry in Psalm 135. And in verse 18, he says, those who make idols become like them. So do all who trust in them. And so church, we are not to make a Jesus in our own thinking, saying, well, this is what I think of Jesus. Here's what I have the idea of Jesus. No, we are to look upon the scriptures and see that Jesus is the way and the truth and the life. He is our propitiation for our sin. He is our advocate with the Father. And so we must walk in Christ and we must know Christ because we are surrounded by a fallen world that is in the grip and the power of the evil one that is rampant with idolatry. See, it's not the cultural, idolized, created Jesus that the world takes issue with. It's the biblical Jesus. Everybody likes the idea of a prophet or a teacher who says good things and tells stories and parables and multiplies bread. But it gets very explicit when he says, I am the only way. Follow me, you say, die to yourself. Abandon your selfishness. And so again, John warns us, keep yourself from idols because idolatry will rip from you the truth of who Jesus Christ is. Now I know I've been quoting a lot of hymns lately, um, so I'm hoping this quotation will not be much less dignified, but in the words of Simon and Garfunkel, they write in an interesting song, the people bowed and prayed to the neon God they made, and the sign flashed out its warning in the words that it was forming. And the sign said, the words of the prophets are written on the subway walls and tenement halls and whispered in the sound of silence. Now that's fascinating. There's some truth in those lyrics that those who are filled with idols become indifferent. They fall silent and they bow and pray to the neon God they made. And so, little children, keep yourself from idols. Church, if you want to do that practically, then look to Christ in his word. Learn what it means to worship him and abide in him. Again, the Apostle John told us back in chapter 2, verse 5 and 6, Whoever keeps God's word, in him truly the love of God is perfected. By this we may know that we are in him. Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So keep God's word and live in and live like Jesus Christ. Seek the Lord in prayer. Ask him to help you and to help 
others when you stumble. Because remember, Jesus is our great protector and Lord. He is the Christ, the true God and eternal life. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we come before you and we ask for your further guidance. Lord, we thank you that you have given us understanding in your word. Lord, help us to grow all the more in the Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you, God, that you have reminded us in your word for our need to pray for our brothers and sisters who wrestle with sin. And so, Lord, we ask that as we go now to take the supper, that we would examine ourselves, that we would remember the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and that we would be nourished spiritually. God, we give you great thanks and praise for these truths. We ask that you would strengthen us, help us as we go out from here into this fallen world. May you remind us that through Christ we have overcome. Again, we thank you and praise you. In Jesus' name, amen.